Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. A few years ago on this very channel, I made an episode where I argued that Walt Simonson's run on Thor was the best run. And I stand by that, but Thor as a character has lucked out with several great runs. And one that I would put way up there at the top is the run by Jason Aaron. Jason Aaron ended up writing Thor for over seven years, about twice as long as Walt Simonson's run paired up with fantastic artists like Asad Ripich and Russell Dodderman, Aaron was able to craft some epic stories that simultaneously asked a deeply personal question about the main character. What does it mean to be considered worthy? So today we're going to answer that question primarily through the lens of looking at the first 11 issues of Jason Aaron's run on Thor. Let's do it. Jason Aaron broke into comics twice, you could say. In 2001, he won a Marvel Comics submission contest and had a Wolverine short story published in issue 175 the following year. But he made a big impact in 2006 after he submitted an unsolicited pitch to Vertigo, which became the Vietnam War story The Other Side. That led to him pitching the crime story Scalped, set on a modern-day Native American reservation. He soon began writing for places like Top Cow, DC, and a lot for Marvel, going exclusive with them in 2007. He began writing Thor, God of Thunder, in 2012. Aaron wanted to do more than tell a superhero story. His stories work on focusing on what makes the characters unique. In a 2013 interview with Comic Book Resources, Aaron explained that his goal was to lean into the fact that Thor is a god. Aaron explained, quote, I wanted to do a story that had a huge scope and scale to it, end quote. To that end, Aaron created a new adversary known as Gore the God Butcher and invented a story where the antagonist faces Thor in the present, his past, and his far future. It's an opportunity to look at how the character has grown as well as plant the seeds of where he could end up. The first five issues alternate between the three time periods, and Aaron uses something unique to comics, narration boxes, that allow us access to the character's inner monologue. That helps us understand the differences between these three versions of Thor. The younger Thor is a hot-headed warrior, focused on the glory of battle, drinking good ale, and betting women. This takes place over a thousand years ago, where he revels in the company of Vikings after killing a frost giant. Thor is not yet worthy of carrying his mighty hammer Mjolnir, and instead goes into battle with the axe Jarnbjorn. While impulsive and shallow, this Thor still fights to protect mankind. His heart is in the right place. Modern day Thor is a superhero, but this story doesn't focus too much on that. There's a cameo of Iron Man at one point, and another short scene with his Asgardian warrior friend Volstagg, which sets things firmly in the Marvel Universe, but this story features Thor on a cosmic quest to solve a mystery. It begins with Thor visiting an alien planet dealing with a drought, and he uses his godly powers to call down rain from the heavens above. In talking to the people of this world, he learns from a little girl that they have no gods, something that he has never encountered. Flying to the heavens, Thor visits the desolate kingdom of the alien gods, only to find two things, a berserker dog made up of a black material and the corpses of the long-dead gods of this world. This begins Thor's adventure. And finally, we meet King Thor at the end of time ruling over an empty Asgard, bearded, missing an eye like his father Odin, and also missing an arm. He seems to use the destroyer armor as a prosthetic. This Thor is depressed and weary, but still summons the willpower to leave his sacred halls, only to encounter thousands of the berserker beasts and be driven back to his chambers again and again. He's like Sisyphus, dealing with a never-ending punishment. While I am focusing on Jason Aaron's writing techniques in this video, talking about his story structure and what he does to develop a character, I want to take a moment to point out how fantastic Asad Ribich's art is for this story arc. Asad does a lot of great things. He sells epic moments by using 
huge splash pages. And he also knows when to pull in close to render some subtle facial expressions. There's an openness to Asad's line art that definitely reminds me of some of the best French and Italian comics. It has that European flavor to it. Um, but I just wanted to talk about how, while you're watching this video, do take a moment to look at that artwork and see how he sells the story, thanks to his hard work. Issue 2 is the debut of Gore. He's built up appropriately when the young Thor goes searching for him and finds the Russian gods falling headless from the sky. Gore emerges from the clouds, pale, gaunt, and snake-faced. His most dangerous feature is his ability to grow a black sword that can cleave through just about anything. This goo can also fashion itself into wings or the endless berserker animals that serve Gore. Gore is so powerful, he can survive a direct thunderbolt summoned by Thor. He is able to overpower Thor, and part of what makes Gore so despicable is his cruelty. He doesn't just kill Thor. Because he dared to challenge Gore, Gore decides to bind Thor in a cave to torture him. He taunts him, not unlike the devil, telling Thor that if he hates one of his fellow gods, perhaps a family member, that Gore will kill them first and save Thor for later. The present-day Thor is forced to work outside of his comfort zone, going to a godly library in search of records on missing gods. It sends him across the universe, learning that whoever is killing gods has been very busy for a very long time. And I will pause to point out that some of Ribich's art is so iconic, it was adapted quite literally for the latest Thor movie. Meanwhile, we see Gore gathering objects of power for an unknown purpose, and he lays out his mission statement. In my travels, I have learned that there are two kinds of gods, those who do harm and those who do nothing at all. I have yet to decide which I find more worthy of my wrath. But soon enough it will no longer matter, as all gods will have one very important trait in common. They will all be dead. Present-day Thor finds an alien god hiding from Gore who claims to have been driven mad by meeting him. It's where Thor begins to connect that this is the same being he met a thousand years ago. This story is very serious, with massive stakes. So it's nice that Aaron gives us some comic relief characters, like the offbeat godly alien and a sarcastic librarian. And make no mistake, this is definitely a dark story. Gore is busy fashioning a pool of blood from gods he's killed. There's as much blood in this story as any superhero tale I've read, that's for sure. The story itself is a mystery that we can't quite figure out because of the non-linear nature of this story. What happened in the past with Gore and Young Thor that leads to him torturing King Thor by keeping him trapped alone in Asgard? Flashbacks in issue 5 give us a hint. While Gore believes all gods are selfish beings, the Norsemen who celebrated with Thor attack Gore and allow Thor to escape. And in the present day, Thor is too late to solve the mystery. Gore uses the pool of blood and other sacred objects that he's gathered to enter the time stream itself, fashioning some sort of massive weapon far in the future. The first five issues of this story are a mystery. We don't know what Gore is up to as he butts up against each different version of Thor throughout time. We get to know Thor very well thanks to his narration, but then things shift in issue six. We finally get Gore's origin and his true motivations. That's a standalone issue guest illustrated by Butch Geis. Gore is an alien on a desolate world. As a young man, his mother tells him to have faith in their gods, even though his father starved to death long ago. As Gore grows up, he loses his mother, his wife, and finally his children. His tribesmen eventually shun Gore for his lack of faith. And Gore probably would have succumbed to starvation, alone and angry, were it not for a pair of gods crashing violently to his world in battle. As Gore approaches one of them, the god begs for help, stabbed with a black object. Gore claims this object, which allows him to fashion a sword with his mind. Gore kills him, and it is then, as he stands over the first god that he has killed, that he begins his new mission, 
to explore the universe and find out if there are any more gods to kill. Gore is an understandable villain. His gods did nothing to help him, and he lived a harsh and tragic life. But Gore is unforgivable, clearly taking pleasure in the sadistic kills and torture of gods that he takes out. After 50 years of Thor stories where he battles giants and gods and monsters, he finally has a new type of enemy, essentially a serial killer. After the standalone gore issue, we get another five issues to this story, and it's interesting to note that the narration style has changed. The first several issues gave us inner monologues. Now that all the players are on the board, that switches to an omniscient narrator. Modern day Thor chases Gore into the future, but arrives later than he did. Gore has enslaved the gods that remain to build a massive orb. Ultimately, we learn that the crazy alien god from earlier is not a simple god of mirth and dancing as he claimed, but the god of bombs. Gore has created a god bomb. Its goal? To wipe out all gods that have ever existed throughout all of time and space. Due to time travel shenanigans, all three versions of Thor are united in the far future against Gore. The battles are appropriately epic. We're talking devil page splashes. We come to learn that Gore's weapon, the source of his power, is known as All Black the Necro Sword. This would go on to be explored by Donny Cates in his run on Venom as the weapon created by Null, god of the symbiotes. The Venom costume is a symbiote, and it explains why the blade can shift and why Gore can create berserker minions. But it's also revealed that Gore uses that substance to craft a wife and a child that are composed of the material. They appear to be sentient, but he created them. Gore's wife, at one point, is so proud of his accomplishments making the god bomb that she declares Gore is her god. Of course, that's the last thing you'd want to say to Gore. When his son learns that Gore has killed his mother, that, until now, loyal son aids the Thor team. I choose to believe that this is an example of Gore having a subconscious desire to almost undermine himself. That there's a kernel of good buried very deep down inside of him. And I think that that makes Gore for a more complex and interesting antagonist. Of course, Thor triumphs in the end. He uses Gore's weapon against him. He wields two Mjolnir hammers. It's grandiose and over the top, but by issue 11, it's earned everything it's giving us, primarily in terms of character. The young Thor is unable to raise Mjolnir. He's not worthy yet. The future Thor was almost ready to give up, but the spark of hope his younger self provided reignites the hero inside. And as the story closes, we end on the central question Aaron asks in this book. Modern day Thor is saying goodbye to King Thor, talking about how Gore was wrong about gods being selfish. Thor tells his old self to live to prove Gore wrong. To that, King Thor asks, but what if he wasn't wrong? And Thor replies, then we have even more work to do. A suitable ending to this story, but an intriguing what-if premise that would eventually lead to Thor believing Gore was right, and thereby losing his worthiness to lift Mjolnir. A mysterious hand soon lifts the hammer, and a new Thor is born, this one initially a mystery, and wearing a helmet that covers her features. This run featured the artwork of Russell Dodderman, who previously worked as a costume designer in film on movies like Captain America. Dodderman is a very different artist than Ribich, but has a great eye for feminine features, exciting monsters, and elaborate costumes and settings. It all helps give that Thor run a regal and important feel. I'm not going to summarize that run, but it does continue to explore what it means to be worthy what it would mean to have godlike power. What responsibility would fall to you if you had that power? It's exciting to see those ideas explored with a new main character. Our Thor is still an important part of those stories and eventually returns, but it builds up this new Thor to show courage in the face of battles both to protect others and very personal fights like one against cancer. That's something that I appreciate about Jason Aaron's writing. He can give us an epic story, lots of spectacle, adventure, humor. 
But there's also going to be something character-based at the heart of it, something grounded, something that we can relate to. I also want to point out that at this point in time, on Jason Aaron's run on Thor, Marvel Comics was going crazy with renumbering and restarting issues. So it can be a little confusing to know the reading order. So following is the reading order for the various Thor series. Thor God of Thunder begins with issue 1 in 2012 and ran for 25 issues, collected in four trade paperback volumes. Then there is the Marvel event Original Sin, which ran for eight issues. That ends with Thor being told a secret that causes him to lose his worthiness, but it is not strictly necessary for following the overall Thor story. In 2014, a new volume called simply Thor began and ran for eight issues and an annual. It's been collected into two trade paperbacks. After that, the Secret Wars event happened, and all the Marvel titles took place in a separate, combined world. There were four issues of a book called Thor's, and again, this is more of a side story that you can opt to skip. Then the book returned to its ongoing story with The Mighty Thor from 2016 through 2018 for another 23 issues, and also a simultaneous five-issue story called Unworthy Thor. The Mighty Thor continued after issue 23 by returning to Marvel's legacy numbering, counting all the previous Thor books and running from issue 700 to 706. The original Thor returns for a new volume called Thor from 2018 through 2019 for 16 issues. Marvel's next event was called War of the Realms and involves a lot of Asgardian characters. And finally, in 2019, Aaron reteamed with Asad Ribich for four issues of King Thor, following the adventures of the Thor from the far future. Let me give you some final thoughts on Jason Aaron. I really like his writing. I really liked his run on Thor. I will say there is one weakness, and that is in the early issues, I don't necessarily know the answer to a question that I think great stories answer, which is, what does the protagonist want? I think that should be able to be boiled down to something simple that we all can understand and relate to. Examples would include, in some of his other books, in Scalped, the main character wants to figure out where he fits in in the world. In Wolverine, Wolverine is trying to become better than what his impulses are guiding him towards. Can he overcome what he considers his nature and be better? In this Thor run, at least in the first few issues, we do get three different viewpoints of Thor, which is interesting and good, but the main Thor, I don't think we truly understand what he wants other than just to maintain the status quo, to protect the world. Um, but we know very much what the antagonist wants, so the antagonist drives the story very well. I will also uh, say that I loved the Mighty Thor portion of Jason Aaron's run when he teamed up with uh, Russell Dodderman. Great new character, uh, great adventure, great mystery, fantastic run. I definitely recommend this run on Thor. That said, I think I'm done with this episode, but I wanted to say to all of you, thank you. A sincere thank you for watching. It means a lot to me. Please, if you've got a moment, if you could just hit like and subscribe, that really helps the channel. It really does. Um, if you're in a position to help, I would love it if you could either become a YouTube member of this channel or support me on Patreon. The links are in the description below. For as little as a dollar, you can get access to some exclusives and you'll get uh, the ability to help me make this happen. Because I really cannot do this show without you. It's just the truth. YouTube by itself, not really enough to uh, keep going. But the fact that I've got so many supporters that's what makes this show possible. And to me, that means a lot. So a sincere thank you. I'm going to see you next week with an awesome Comic Tropes episode. Until then, please remember to keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.